Hello, and welcome back to another edition of Camp Chapters. This round, we're going chapters 30 to 35. All right, this is The Secret Life of Amanda K. Woods, and we are on chapter 30, Lost Lake is Found. Margaret painted the final S on a small sign she had made for the entrance to their driveway. The sign had four trees on it, two big sheltering ones that were supposed to represent their parents, and two smaller ones that were supposed to represent Margaret and Amanda. Underneath them, the Margaret, Margaret had written in neat green letters, the woods. She looked at her work with satisfaction, then she took her paint can over to the north side of the house, got the ladder, and started painting a window frame bright green. Amanda was working too. She was in Skipper's pasture, currying him and hugging him. She had found a nice strip of loose, curling birch bark and put it on top of her head. Could birch bark ever make beautiful, practical hats, she wondered, the way that Birth bark, birch bark curled and clamped hard onto a person's head and stayed there really well. Skipper seemed very interested in, t in it until his attention was distracted by a car turning into the driveway. A man, a woman, and a boy Margaret's age got out of the car, looking around curiously. Even from a distance, Amanda could tell they weren't from around Rome. All three had a special way of walking, a walk that almost had a smile in it. That said, they knew they were strangers, but felt at home anywhere. Margaret studied the strangers from her ladder, looking highly displeased. She had a streak of green paint on her nose. Her naturally straight hair was in bobby pins, so it would be curly in the evening when she went out with Roger. It was a fact of life that a girl had to look horrible in order to look really good later, but strangers had no right to come by unexpectedly and see you that way. Amanda figured it was up to her to help the strangers, no matter how comfortable they looked, they had to be lost. She ducked under Skipper's fence and stepped onto the lawn. The man pointed at Margaret's sign. It looked as if he was going to touch it. Wet paint, Amanda shouted. The woman took the man's arm and pulled his hand away from the size. sign. The boy, ignoring them both, walked up the driveway. As he got close, Amanda recognized him. He was not lost. He was the one person in the world Amanda, Amanda would rather die than meet. Antoine Bonnier halted at the foot of Margaret's ladder and gazed upward, beaming. Amanda, he said, in any place I would know you. I'm not Amanda, Margaret responded crossly. She's Amanda, with her paintbrush, she pointed in Amanda's direction. Amanda ran, ducking back into Skipper's pasture, stumbling past bushes and trees till she got to the lake. No one followed her. She stood panting, looking out over the water, blue waves in rows, not knowing any better, marched fearlessly into, onto the sand. If she didn't go back for a long time, Antoine might leave. Then Amanda would never have to face him. But then she would never know him either. Also, it was not nice to write to someone and trick him and pretend to be friends, and then, when he showed up, not even to speak to him. That was not something Amanda K. Woods would do. Amanda walked up the stone steps from the Woods' beach toward their patio and driveway. Red and yellow moss roses were growing out of the crevices at the edge of the steps, and Amanda paused to pick some, just as if it was what she had had in mind all along. In the clump of people that was the Bonniers and Margaret, Antoine was the one who saw her first. He walked toward her, smiling. She remembered her birch bark hat and was afraid she looked foolish. Quickly, she tore it off her head and threw it onto the grass. In a second, they would meet. Amanda rubbed her Lyle Leverage hand on her jeans. Abruptly, she realized that she smelled very much like a horse, and Antoine liked to bathe, if only she had bathed, or if she had put on lots of tender fire perfume. Even though he thought it was fishy, with enough of it on, a person might at least smell 17. But it was too late for that now. Antoine was at her side. He sniffed. His mouth, mouth curled down. His eyebrows went up and his eyes shone with laughter. The air here is indeed wonderful, he said. He took Amanda's Lyle Leverage hand and raised it high as if it were delicate and beautiful. Miss Amanda K. Woods, he said, enchanted. Amanda nodded. Something in her throat had gone into, grown into a strange numbness the size of a golf ball, and she couldn't speak. Gracefully, she bowed. She handed Antoine the moss roses. With a bow of his own, Antoine took the flowers and handed them to his mother. Flowers, he said in a beautiful accent. 
Very pretty, Miss bon Mrs. Bonnier said in the same beautiful accent. So she would smell better. Amanda pu pulled the curry comb out of her back pocket and threw it toward Skipper's pasture. Then she rubbed both her hands on her jeans and shook hands with Antoine's parents. Amanda, we so much enjoyed your fine and mysterious letters, Antoine's father said. We have been curious to meet you. Amanda nodded. Margaret said, un peu de l'eau. Amanda heard, un peu de l'eau. She figured it must be French because Mrs. Bonnier seemed to know just what it was and said something like, no mer to see, no mer see. Another car rolled into the driveway. Amanda's father, the golf ball dissolved in Amanda's throat. She could speak. Here comes my father, she said. I'll introduce you. He walked up to them all with a cordial, inquiring gleam in his eyes. Her father was so at ease with strangers, maybe more at ease with strangers than with people he knew. Amanda remembered how you were supposed to do introductions. She took a deep breath and got all the words out. Daddy, I would like to introduce you to Antoine, my pen pal from France, and his parents, Mr. and Mrs. Bonnier. Antoine, Mrs. Bonnier, Mr. Bonnier, her father said, I am very pleased to welcome you to Lost Lake and to our home. My wife is off playing bridge, but when I tell you, her you're here, I'm sure she'll be very eager to meet you. Amanda hadn't expected her father to sound so warm and so comfortable. She admired his manners very much. They were almost French. I sent you a letter, Amanda said, telling you how much trouble it could be to get here. Antoine did receive your letter, Mrs. Bonnier said. It seemed to us a challenge. You were so kind to worry, Mr. Bonnier said, but we had no trouble to arrive, none at all. Amanda's father invited everyone into the house. Amanda and Margaret started coffee brewing for everyone and then hurried back into their room. Amanda took a washcloth from the bathroom and quickly scrubbed herself. When Margaret's head was turned, she borrowed quite a bit of tender fire. Margaret stopped pulling bobby pins out of her hair. Amanda, she said, why did your pen pal think I was you? It was an accident, Amanda said. Guilt blazed into her head. She had taken Margaret's photo. She had written Margaret, who is sometimes a pain in the neck, but I think she will grow up someday. Margaret stared at her. Amanda put her thumbs together below her chin. The fingers on her maybe average left hand clung desperately to the fingers on her Lyle Leverage enchanting right hand. I mean, I tried to copy the way you sound when I wrote him to sound older, and I knew about the beats because you told me what to say, so he thought I was older, that's all. Margaret dropped a bobby pin on her desk, and her suspicions seemed to drop with it. Well, if I'd known he, would come, he was coming, I would have dressed up, she said. Me too, Amanda said. When, in fresh clothes, Amanda and Margaret brought coffee into the living room, it seemed everyone was settling in for a good long visit. The Bonniers were making plans to stay overnight at the Rome Hotel, and Amanda's father was inviting them to dinner there. He had phoned Amanda's mother right in the middle of her bridge game. She would come to dinner at the hotel, too. Antoine looked at Margaret a lot. He told her he hoped she was coming to dinner. When she said she was sorry, but she had a date, he looked disappointed. Still, he also looked at Amanda often, and every time he did, he was smiling. She decided she could smile too, and then she realized there was something she wanted very much for him to see. Amanda's dad said the two of them could ride Skipper Devil as long as they didn't go too far. Amanda rode in front with Antoine behind the saddle, straddling Skipper's bare back. Her dad came out to see them off. Don't make Skipper run. The two of you are quite a load, he said. You're growing out of your horse, Amanda. It's soon time you got a big one. Skipper is a big horse, Amanda said, and she and Antoine rode away. Did you hear that? Amanda said to Antoine. My dad might want me to give up Skipper. How could he? Well, if you get too big, Antoine said. But I never want to get too big for Skipper, Amanda said. Then just don't eat much, Antoine said. Stay small. But I want to be taller than Margaret, Amanda said. Maybe you should eat tall, skinny foods, Antoine said. Celery, asparagus, green beans, not beets. Or maybe you could have two horses, a new one to ride, and Monsieur Skipper for your friend. That would be the best, Amanda said. They had reached the turnoff for the meadow. Hang on, Amanda said. She neck reined Skipper, and he clambered onto the ghost road. 
It's the end of it that's the most special part, she said. In a little while, we'll get there. And it did seem just minutes till the road ended and they entered the meadow, its flowers shining in the sun. What a beautiful place, Antoine said, and it is so wild. The wilderness here must come into people and make them beautiful too, maybe. Maybe, Amanda said. The flowers are like little suns, Antoine said. This place was here for years, but I never knew it, Amanda said. They got down from Skipper and walked into the flowers. Antoine, Amanda said, I just thought you wouldn't write to me if I sent you my own picture. I think I would have written to you anyway, Antoine said. Your letters are very entertaining. Did I sound 17, Amanda asked. The part I could understand, yes. For the rest, if I had a little sister, I would like it if she sounded like you. If I had a brother, Amanda said, I wish he would be like you. She looked towards Skipper. Over there, she said, pointing, remembering. Last summer, I found a four-leaf clover. A year had passed since Amanda had seen the meadow. It had died under the snow and been reborn. It was still totally beautiful, she thought, unexchanged, except for one thing. It wasn't lonesome anymore. Chapter 32, Dear Diary. Antoine Bonnier is my friend, even though I tricked him. He is wonderful. He says he wishes he had a sister like me. We went on a long ride and talked. I taught him words in American, but he couldn't understand circulating, even when I explained it. He said if he felt like hanging out with friends, he did. If he felt like staying home, he did that. I don't know what the word is for that, but it sounds like more fun than circulating. I will write much more later because right now I feel so happy. I can't sit still. I want to swim and dive and dive and dive. Then I'll have to get ready fast for dinner with Antoine and his family. I feel like a rainbow. Chapter 33, how the French say goodbye when they like you. At dinner, there were candles on the table and everyone sparkled and laughed and got along. Amanda's mother found out that her favorite French recipes were some of Mrs. Bonnier's favorites too, which made it 100% sure that the recipes were really French. When Amanda's mother found out that both the Bonniers were professors of mathematics, she was very impressed. She told the Bonniers, Amanda is very gifted, especially at math. And Mr. Bonnier said, if you are interested in mathematics, I will show you something you should know. He took a long strip of paper from his pocket, twisted it once, and brought the two ends together with a twist. He joined the ends and a, with a bit of candle wax, and then he handed the strip to Amanda. Except for the twist, it looked just like a simple circle. But when Amanda ran her finger along it, she realized that the inside became the outside and the outside became the inside. So that, in fact, the two sides were only one. It is called a Mobius strip, Mrs. Bonnier said. It is important to geometry and in life too. Sometimes the outside turns into the inside and the inside into the outside. Keep it, Mr. Bonnier said. Let it be a souvenir of our visit. Of course, if this one gets ruined, any time you can make many more. The next morning, Amanda went into town with her dad to have breakfast with the Bonniers and to say goodbye to them. She would have asked Margaret too, but Margaret was still sleeping, so she didn't want to wake her. Charlie looked, cooked them a French breakfast, what he called crepe Suzettes, thin pancakes that came to the table flaming. Then he sat down with the Bonniers and told them about the French traders who had explored Wisconsin and about old logging days. Afterward, Amanda drove with the Bonniers around Rome and showed them things. The beautiful bandstand in the park where there weren't concerts anymore because instead of going to the park, people stayed inside and watched TV. The Red Cedar River, Pam's house, where without Pam there, it was impossible to say what was so great about it. And their school, which looked blank and boring without children, that is, people, around it. Then the Bonniers drove Amanda back to the hotel and they said goodbye to Amanda's father. In the hotel lobby, Antoine took a red beret from his pocket and handed it to Amanda. For when you do not want to wear the tree bark, he said. Thank you, Amanda said. She put it on. Not so, Antoine said, not straight. He set the beret farther back on Amanda's head at an angle. Now you look French. Amanda looked at herself in the lobby mirror, her cheeks flushed, her hair shining under the red beret. Did she look French? 
Anyhow, she liked the way she looked. She turned to Antoine. But I don't have a gift for you, she said. You give me the pleasure of knowing you, Antoine said. That is the best gift. It's a pleasure to know you too, Amanda said. She hoped that Antoine would send more letters to her, but she didn't want to ask. As if he'd read her thought, Antoine said, I'll write. He bent down and whispered in her ear, you can be my little sister. He hugged Amanda and kissed her quickly once on each cheek. Then Mr. and Mrs. Bonnier also each kissed Amanda once on each cheek. By the time she kissed Antoine's dad, Amanda realized that in France, as the other person kissed you on each of your cheeks, you were supposed to kiss him on each of his cheeks, and she actually managed to do it. It must have taken the French centuries of civilization to figure out their double kiss. Amanda thought, probably they couldn't even begin to work on it until they had given up the guillotine. When she got back home, her mother wanted to know if she realized that the Bonniers were very special people and that being a mathematician was a very special thing and that Amanda could be a mathematician one day too if she wanted. And Amanda thought how wrong people could be when they thought about what you could or couldn't do based on what you were already doing. Chapter 34, Land of the Pharaohs. The packing for Margaret's e trip east to Wellesley took three days. Margaret had given up her job at the hospital to prepare for going away. There wasn't enough space in Margaret and Amanda's room to pack, so Margaret and her mother had moved all the living room furniture to one side and set the two steamer trunks being used for the trip in front of the fireplace. In the evenings, Amanda's dad stayed out on the porch reading to keep out of the way, he said. He wasn't interested in the packing, but Amanda was fascinated. It reminded Amanda so much of what they'd studied in Miss Harmon's class about the burial of the Egyptian pharaohs. What made it like the burial of the pharaohs, of course, wasn't that Margaret was dying or being buried, but that everything she owned was going into the trunks, and the whole process was very serious. As it all went in, Amanda thought someone should have been swinging incense, incense as maybe ancient, ancient Egyptian priests did. It seemed as if everything was so well and carefully packed that it would be preserved, not just for a train trip to the east, but for a thousand years. It went, in went five new cashmere sweaters, 10 skirts, five Oxford style blouses, and two pullover sweaters, one pair of jeans for the dorm and one pair of slacks for the country. Two girdles, one of which allowed bathing, breathing and another for occasions when you wanted to look really thin and breathing didn't matter. A hat for church, gray felt with a blue-green feather on it, three party dresses, two basic black and one red, white gloves for spring and summer parties, black suede gloves for winter and real cultured pearls, a graduation present from Margaret's grandparents, godparents. All the clothes had to go in very carefully with layers of tissue paper between them and within their folds so that nothing would get crushed, the tissue paper was very important. When Margaret unpacked, her mother said, everything would look as if it came directly from a hanger in her closet without a wrinkle. Underneath the clothes went layers of heavier stuff, three pairs of shoes and two pairs of winter boots, one to really deal with snow and another pair for dates. Margaret's winter jacket and her winter coat, the pictures of all her friends from high school and her senior yearbook, which said she was the most popular girl in her class. They called Amanda's dad off the porch for advice on packing the appliances. Margaret's radio alarm clock, a brand new electric popcorn popper in which you could also heat up soup for all your friends and which Amanda's mother was sure would make Margaret very popular. An electric coffee pot so she could make coffee when she was studying, her typewriter, her hair dryer, which looked like a typewriter until you opened it, and then a long hose and a big plastic helmet appeared, ready to go on, go around the largest size curlers and dry the wettest hair in 30 minutes, just as well as the giant hair drying helmet at the beauty parlor. Margaret, Margaret's slide rule and her advanced biology book and Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. Amanda's dad advised them to protect all the appliances by packing them in towels and washcloths, so they did. On the evening of the third day of packing, when they were just about to close the trunks, Margaret dug into her closet and brought out her old stuffed panda bear. 
He had no fur on his stomach because M Margaret had carried him around so much. His button eyes were loose, but hanging on, and his nose was completely smashed in. He looked surprised, but pleased to be thought of after so many years, and, having survived kindergarten and grade school, suddenly to be going away to college. Amanda's mother looked surprised at seeing the panda bear, but all she said was, be careful the bear doesn't crush any clothes. After Amanda wrote in her diary about the packing and the pharaohs, she felt let down. But then she realized she could tell Pam about it when Pam got back from her vacation. And she could write Antoine about it. Now he knew her. Now when she wrote, she wouldn't have to pretend to be someone else. She could stay her own real thoughts and he would understand. Chapter 35. A future is something you protect. Amanda's mother had sent her out fishing. Probably her mother had thought Amanda would be gone for hours, but Amanda had caught a lot of fish quickly and come home to clean them. She was standing in Skipper's pasture outside her parents' bedroom window, about to bury the fish heads and entrails, when the serious conversation about Margaret's future started. Amanda was probably not supposed to hear any of it, but in fact she heard the whole thing. Her mother and Margaret were in the bedroom, and her mother was looking for something more to give Margaret three embroidered linen handkerchiefs with lace around the edges, which would be good to perfume and carry in an evening bag to the theater, her mother said, because of course you will go to the theater. You couldn't live so near Boston and not go. The theater is part of the life of any civilized person. The handkerchiefs are pretty, Margaret said. Amanda was going to stick the spade and to start burying the fish heads, but she stopped when her mother said, as if it had just occurred to her for the first time. You do like Roger Moss very much, don't you, Margaret? He's a nice person, Margaret said. And he likes you very much, Amanda's mother said, in that tone she had of knowing everything. He likes me some, Margaret said. You know, Margaret, this concerns me. I don't think you should leave Roger dangling. I'm not, Margaret said. Then she added, as if she couldn't help herself. Roger is Roger. He's not dangling. Is he going to write you? Maybe, Margaret said, if he wants to. What I am afraid of is that he might be too serious about you. A boy like Roger is not right for you, Margaret. Maybe not, Margaret said. You have been having a summer romance, and summer romances end, Margaret's mother said. Sure, of course, Margaret said. Mother, I don't want to talk about this. Your not wanting to talk about Roger is just the reason we should talk. Margaret, it makes me worried that you're too serious about him. I am not too serious about him, Margaret said. Then certainly you're not going to, then certainly you're going to disappoint him, Margaret's mother said. I'm leaving. He knows I'm leaving, Margaret said. These things can drag on and on. I would hate for Roger to think there's a future in waiting for you. I would hate for you to think there's a future in waiting with Roger. Who knows, Margaret said. How are you so sure you know? I do know, Margaret's mother said. Roger Moss is the kind of boy who could ruin your life. The whole world is opening up for you, Margaret. If I had your chance, I wouldn't ha have looked twice at Roger Moss. You're going to enter the best society, meet the most accomplished people. Roger Moss is nothing compared to the kind of people you're going to know. Roger is not nothing. How dare you say he's nothing, Margaret cried. I didn't mean it that way. Of course he's not nothing, darling, Amanda's mother said soothingly. The point is, the best way to get a new life is to go unattached, to go not looking back, not diminishing your new life by hanging on to the old one. I am one person now, and I'm going to be the same person out east, Margaret said. When you get there, maybe yes. But you're going to change, Margaret. You're going to change a lot. I suppose, I suppose everyone changes, Margaret said that doesn't have anything to do with Roger. You know the changes are coming. Begin them now. You know they're going to want to date when you're out east. I suppose so. I haven't thought about it. You haven't talked about it with Roger? No, Margaret said. Well, that, well, that isn't fair to Roger, is it? Or to you? You really must talk to him, Margaret. Let him know now that you need your freedom. You really must do it. Believe me, it will make everything easier for him and for you too. Will you do it? Margaret said nothing. Amanda could hear, but maybe she had nodded her head. And then tell him we've decided that it's fine for him to come to your going away party with all your other friends. 
but not to come to the station to say goodbye at the train. That's just for family. But I want him to come to the train. Margaret, you don't want to give Roger the idea that you're closer to him than you really are. I have great expectations for you. I always have. All your life, Daddy and I ha have helped you in every way that we can. We're giving you the finest education there is. I earned it. I could have it. I could have it anyway. I could have a full scholarship to Wellesley or anywhere. I'm that good, Margaret said. The thing is, dear, you never could have had a full scholarship. Daddy makes too much money. No school would give you one because our family income is too high. If it weren't for us, for Daddy, you wouldn't be going. Don't you think you owe us a little consideration? Can't you give a little attention to us, to your family, to how we think, to what we want? This is what Daddy wants too, Margaret asked. Of course, he agrees with me, Margaret's mother said. All right, Margaret said. Now, can we talk about something else? And Margaret's mother said, of course. In the middle of the night, the bed moved, and Amanda woke up. Margaret was moving around in the dark, a flashlight in one hand and tissue paper in the other. She, th she took the corsage of roses Roger had given her for the prom off the bulletin board and looked at it, and started to wrap it. But as soon as the tissue paper touched it, the corsage shattered and all the petals fell. And that is the end of chapter 35. Thank you again for following along. I hope all is well. And uh, thank you again.